Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is St. Patrick's Day in Black 47. This podcast looks at St. Patrick's Day in Dublin during one of the worst years of the Great Hunger, that is 1847, or as it's simply known in Irish history, Black 47. I've been able to glean a huge amount of information about what happened in the city on what is one of the most infamous St. Patrick's Days. In this intriguing story, we will see that Dublin was a sharply divided city in 1847, with the rich and poor living worlds apart. I came across much of this information when researching my new Dublin Famine Tour. This is a new interactive experience I've just launched. On this walking tour, I bring you on a journey through what were the slums of Victorian Dublin to forgotten prisons and military barracks. You also get listening devices on the tour, so you get to hear what Dublin sounded like in the 1840s. It's a really cool tour, basically a cross between a live podcast and a walking tour. You can find out more at dublinfamintour.ie, but hopefully I'll see you on that tour this summer. Now we're off to St. Patrick's Day in Black 47. I kick off with a look at what St. Patrick's Day was like in the 19th century. Then I focus on life in Dublin in 1847, before we hone in on the day itself, March 17th, 1847. March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, has been celebrated as Ireland's national holiday for centuries. While it would later become heavily associated with Irish independence in particular, in the early 19th century it was celebrated by all sections of Irish society regardless of their political affiliations. Even the British army garrisons stationed on the island marked the day. While these 19th century celebrations did not match modern parades for size, colour and entertainment, the day was still regarded as a great spectacle. In 1826, an English visitor who had been in Dublin for St. Patrick's Day festivities was heavily impressed. They would later tell a friend that Patrick's Day in Dublin is a scene of festivity and mirth unequalled by anything observable in England. However, everything changed in the late 1840s. As famine gripped Ireland, many had nothing to celebrate. By 1847, the Great Hunger was reaching catastrophic levels. Hundreds of thousands had already perished from hunger and disease. The future for hundreds of thousands more hung in the balance. They had no food or hope. Marking St. Patrick's Day was the last thing on their minds. The American travel writer, Anseneth Nicholson, captured the prevailing mood among those at risk from famine. Writing from the Mayo town of Castle Bar in the late 1840s, she found what was a subdued mood on St. Patrick's Day. Nicholson would later recall, The mirth of the land has emphatically ceased. The spirit is broken. Every effort at conviviality appears as if making a last struggle for life. The shamrock was sprinkled here and there upon a hat, but like its wearer, seemed drooping as being conscious that its bloom was scathed and its beauty dying forever. This account is what we might expect. However, Ireland was a very divided country and Antoinette Nicholson was only articulating the perspective of those suffering from famine. During the year known as Black 47, St. Patrick's Day revealed that there was, if anything, two very different Irelands existing side by side. One was on its knees facing starvation. This was the Ireland Antoinette Nicholson was writing about. However, there were also those in society unaffected by famine, who continued to spend money lavishly, almost as if nothing was happening. This was evident in Dublin in particular on St. Patrick's Day. Before we look at the day itself, I will explain a little bit about how Dublin had fared during the Great Famine, up until 1847. The city in Dublin endured a very atypical experience of the Great Famine. While the population of most counties fell sharply, the opposite was the case in Dublin. However, while the population grew, This masked terrible suffering among the city poor. Huge numbers of people were flocking to the capital, some in search of work, others hoping to emigrate and escape the famine. But in Dublin, they only found more poverty. They packed into the already crowded city slums where they lived in horrific conditions. By 1847, Dublin's institutions, such as the prisons and workhouses, were overflowing. Death rates were soaring. This was surely no city for celebrations on St. Patrick's Day. People had other concerns, such as 
their very survival. As you will see, this was true of some, but not all Dubliners. While the city poor faced a gauntlet of starvation and disease, the great hunger did not affect everyone. If you could afford it, there was plenty of food to be had in Dublin. Generally speaking, the wealthy in the city were by and large unaffected. They did of course run the risk of contracting disease, but the rich who did were comparatively few in number. Therefore, somewhat perversely, those unaffected by the famine were unwilling to let St. Patrick's Day pass off without the usual festivities in 1847, and while one half of the city starved, the other planned a party. As is the case with the modern holiday, Victorian Dubliners had long organised what might be regarded as official celebrations for St. Patrick's Day. The representatives of the British Army and Government, then ruling Ireland, had marked the occasion with parades and in 1847 they saw no reason not to do so, even if many in Dublin were facing death. St. Patrick's Day in 1847 fell on a Wednesday and the festivities began early with a large military parade organised by the British Army garrison in the city. At 11am crowds had gathered at the Royal Barracks, a vast complex on the edge of Victorian Dublin, which is known as Collins Barracks today. The parade began when the 13th Light Dragoons and the 83rd Regiment marched out of the barracks gates heading for Dublin Castle for a party. The easiest way to the castle took the garrison along the north quays of the River Liffey before crossing a Capel Street Bridge from where they could enter what was the medieval quarter of Dublin and the castle. As they made their way along the city quays, they were led by Sir Edward Blackeney, the commander-in-chief of the British Army, while military bands added to the festive mood. When they reached Dublin Castle, they paraded into what was known as the Upper Yard, where they were welcomed by the elite of Irish society. John William Ponsonby, better known as Lord of Bessborough, a native of Kilkenny and the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, came out onto the balcony of the castle to welcome them in. He was accompanied not only by his own family, but also a member of the British royal family, Prince George of Cambridge. All sported shamrocks and the band played God Save the Queen, the anthem of the United Kingdom, which was followed by the tune St. Patrick's Day in the Morning, Ireland's National Air. This was the way one half of the city celebrated. However, while all this was taking place, in the neighbouring parish of St. Andrews, only a few hundred metres from Dublin Castle, and certainly within earshot, hundreds of starving people were forming queues in what was another, more macabre, St. Patrick's Day event. This could not be described as a celebration of any kind. The British government had recently announced a new policy of opening soup kitchens and they had enlisted a celebrity chef, the Jamie Oliver of the day if you will, a French man called Alexis Sawyer, to devise recipes and create a model soup kitchen. Sawyer had come to Dublin and was, by St Patrick's Day, in the middle of constructing his model soup kitchen. However, he did not want to let the day pass off without some event and on March 17th he served a hundred gallons of his soup to the poor of St Andrew's Parish. Sawyer's soup was for the day named St Patrick's Day Soup, but one wonders whether the starving poor even noticed. The fact that it was flavoured with dillisk, a form of seaweed, highlighted what was a penny-pinching attitude towards famine relief in Dublin from the city authorities. Meanwhile, as the poor queued, they could hear the celebrations back in Dublin Castle, where dancing in the courtyard had followed the parade. This was only the beginning though of what were tone-deaf celebrations to mark St. Patrick's Day that year. Later that evening, large crowds again began to assemble at Dublin Castle. These were drawn from what were described by one newspaper as Dublin's elite, numbering around 1,000 people. In all, they had returned to attend what was the traditional Patrick's Day Ball. The Lord Lieutenant, Bessborough, accompanied by his daughters, the Prince and many of Dublin's influential figures including the Lord Mayor, Michael Staunton, were in attendance. Exactly how much money was spent in Dublin Castle that night is not known, but it was presumably hundreds if not thousands of pounds in 19th century money, a very considerable sum indeed. While these celebrations seem totally inappropriate in hindsight, we can't even say that the elite were simply ignorant of what was going on around them. In Dublin Castle, at that ball on St. Patrick's Night, there were those who were among the best informed as to the effects famine was taking on the city population. 
For example, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Michael Staunton, had that very day witnessed some of the most desperate cases in the city. Before he had dressed himself for the ball, Staunton had, in his capacity as chair, attended a meeting of the Board of Guardians of the North Dublin Workhouse. There he had seen a very different Dublin on St Patrick's Day, one that could not be more far removed from the celebrations in the castle that night, as we will see after this quick break. Hi folks and thanks a million for downloading the show, I really appreciate it. If you're enjoying this podcast and the Great Famine series, you should check out dublinfamintour.ie. That's my new walking tour around Dublin, which reveals what is often the forgotten story of how the famine affected Dublin. Now this is not like a normal walking tour. Each person on the tour gets a listening device, which not only means you won't have to strain to hear what I'm saying, but you also get to hear the sound effects of Victorian Dublin. While I can't recreate what it looked like, this tour is as close as you're going to get to the past. You will be in the places where some of the key events of the Great Famine took place, hearing the history while also hearing sounds from the time. Like the podcast, the tour is based on personal stories of those who endured the famine, so if you're enjoying this, you're going to love this tour. It's really easy to book your place, simply go to dublinfamintour.ie. You can find out more there and as I say, book your place. Tours run every Thursday, Friday and Saturday at 3pm, so book your place now at dublinfamintour.ie. If you're living overseas and unable to make the tour this year, I would really appreciate if you can share this with family and friends. So one last time, that URL is dublinfamintour.ie. That's dublinfamintour.ie. There were few who moved between the Dublin of the haves and have-nots on St. Patrick's Day in the way the Lord Mayor of the city, Michael Staunton, had. A nationalist in outlook, he seems to have had no problem with the celebrations that took place in Dublin to mark St. Patrick's Day. This is pretty surprising given there were few better acquainted with the crisis that was enveloping Dublin than he was. As chair of the Board of Guardians of the North Dublin Workhouse, he had been informed that very day how bad things were. The North Dublin Workhouse was one of two such institutions designed to provide aid to the destitute of the city. Built on the northern fringe of Dublin near Smithfield, it had opened in 1840 under the new poor laws of the time. Conditions in the workhouse changed dramatically when the famine began in late 1845. Originally designed to hold 2,000 people, from late 1846 it was nearing its capacity. By St. Patrick's Day 1847 it was heavily overcrowded. At the meeting of the Board of Guardians held on St. Patrick's Day, the Lord Mayor Michael Staunton heard how there were now 2,781 people in the institution. The dining hall had been converted into a dormitory to try and accommodate the huge numbers desperately needing help. In the previous week alone, between March 10th and St. Patrick's Day, over 200 people had been admitted and 41 had died. We can only imagine how hearing these statistics while the sounds of celebrations wafted across the River Liffey from Dublin Castle must surely have made some of those present feel somewhat uncomfortable. With the workhouse way over capacity, the conditions inside deteriorated drastically. The American writer we met earlier, Ansonette Nicholson, commented on the general condition inside workhouses during the famine. Before the famine, they were, many of them, quite interesting objects for a stranger to visit generally, kept clean, not crowded, and the food sufficient. But when the famine advanced, they were little else than charnel houses, while the living, shivering skeletons that squatted up on the floors or stood with arms folded against the walls were half clad with hair uncombed and hands and faces unwashed. This is what the 200 people driven to seek refuge in the North Dublin workhouse faced on St. Patrick's Day 1847. This was a far cry from the celebrations in Dublin Castle. To make matters worse, many of their fellow Dubliners were actually hostile to the idea of helping them. This was seen at the meeting of the Board of Guardians of the North Dublin workhouse held on St. Patrick's Day, when one of the institution's doctors reported on the grave conditions he faced in the course of his work. 
He informed the board that fever was rising in the institution, but that the patient could not be transferred to the Dublin Fever Hospital because it was already full. They had to be kept in the workhouse hospital, increasing the risk of contagion. When a request was made for another doctor to help with the workload, one member of the board, a certain Thomas Arkin, was openly hostile. He said he would not, and I quote from the Freeman's Journal, waste public money on another doctor. When he referred to public money, he was referring to the taxpayers who funded the workhouse. This sentiment illustrates how divided Dublin was during the famine and explains how some could see no problem in organising celebrations amid suffering. While this is the view of what might be considered the haves, next I want to look at that day from the perspective of some of the have-nots. When I was making this podcast, I wanted to give voice to some of the famine victims who were in Dublin on that St. Patrick's Day. The story so far has focused on the events of the rich and powerful, the parties, the parades and even the meeting of the Board of Guardians. There were no famine victims there. So what about the poor who could not celebrate? Who were they? Well, I went through the workhouse records to find the names and stories of those who were admitted to the North Dublin workhouse on St. Patrick's Day itself to give you some insight into their lives. On St. Patrick's Day, while celebrations were taking place less than a kilometre away at Dublin Castle, 48 people were admitted to the North Dublin workhouse. They ranged in age from a two-month-old baby to people in their 60s. Most were in rags and their health varied. A large minority were sick. The most worrying of these cases were three who had fever, which was highly contagious and could easily spread in the overcrowded conditions of the workhouse. Of the individuals mentioned in the records, their stories hint at tragic famine experiences. For example, the Derry native Mary Wilson was one of those admitted to the workhouse on St. Patrick's Day. She brought with her her two-year-old grandchild, Jane McCann. Aged 66, Mary Wilson arrived at the workhouse store, very ill with bronchitis. The fact that her grandchild Jane was with her provokes the question as to where the child's parents were. Had they already fallen victim to the famine? Had they emigrated and left the child with Mary? We will never know, but we can be sure the notion of celebrating a national holiday was far from their minds. In any case, Mary Wilson and her granddaughter were admitted However, as we have seen on that day, the Guardians were resisting spending more money on doctors. Indeed, the workhouse would prove scarcely any better than her own home, and within three weeks the grandmother, Mary Wilson, had died on April the 8th. Young Jane McCann, her granddaughter, now an orphan, faced a life in the workhouse. She did survive, however, and left the institution in September 1848. What happened to her is unclear. Perhaps her parents, or another relation, had returned to get her. Another who arrived at the workhouse door on St. Patrick's Day that year was the recently widowed Catherine Hogarty and her young son Andrew, aged only two months of age. St. Patrick's Day was just the beginning of extreme hardship for Catherine. For an unknown reason, she left the workhouse on October 3rd, 1847, but did not bring her son Andrew with her. Why she did this is unclear. Tragically, the boy died eight days later, a fate not unheard of when young children are separated from their parents. While the vast majority of admissions to the workhouse on St. Patrick's Day 1847 did survive, the fact that those who didn't were either older or younger highlighted who was most likely to suffer. First and foremost, it was obviously the poor, but within that group, it was the old and young. For the others who did survive, life in the workhouse was hard, but the life they were trying to escape was usually worse. One wonders, did they even know it was St. Patrick's Day? By 1847, the priorities of the poor were firmly focused on survival. From the depths of this misery that the North Dublin workhouse had become, I want to close the podcast by returning to Dublin Castle, where the grand St. Patrick's Day Ball drew to a close at midnight. This is literally moving one kilometre across Victorian Dublin, but it was worlds apart on March 17th, 1847. The surroundings of the castle, the celebrations, the unspoken but implicit hope in the future that those in attendance had given their status in society were all absent back in the workhouse. However, there was an unusual symmetry between the most powerful man in the castle that night and many of the poor across the city. That is, they knew they had seen their last St. Patrick's Day. The Lord Lieutenant himself, Lord Bessborough, 
had been ailing for several months and was growing sicker with each passing week. Like so many in the city slums, in the workhouses and other institutions, he knew death was coming soon. Lord Bessborough died on May 16th, 1847, but while he may have had a brief unifying moment with the city poor, the two Irelands that had become apparent on St. Patrick's Day were never more clearly on display than in the way they were treated after death. People like Mary Wilson, the grandmother who died in the workhouse, or young Andrew Hogarty were buried in anonymous mass graves. They probably have never been mentioned until I randomly picked them out of a list of people admitted to the workhouse on St. Patrick's Day. Lord Bessborough, on the other hand, however, was returned to his native Kilkenny, where he was buried. When news reached London of his death, Bessborough was eulogised in the British Parliament in a moving speech by the Prime Minister, Lord John Russell. This is just a snapshot of Dublin in 1847. St. Patrick's Day, while supposedly a day to celebrate being Irish, had only served to highlight the fact that there were two very different Irelands in Black 47. One of a people suffering untold misery, living alongside people living in relative comfort, largely unaffected by the famine. They had very little in common. If you want to hear more about the story of the Great Famine in Dublin, don't forget to check out my new Dublin Famine Tour. You can find out more and book your place at dublinfamintour.ie. Hopefully I'll get to meet you on a tour soon. The next podcast is the second episode in the story of famine immigration and that looks at the story of Canada and coffin ships. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>